everything that I'm living right now in my life is what was given to me as a young person. When I found the cello at age four, that was it. There was the one thing in my life that people had to ask me to stop doing. Hey all, welcome back to City Limitless. I'm your host, Ashley, and this week I'm so excited for our guest. We have the guest artistic director of the Mesa Art Center, and not only that, he is a Grammy award-winning solo cellist, Zul Bailey. Welcome, Zul. How are you? Very good. Happy to speak to you today. Yeah, we're so excited to have you on. Like I mentioned, you are the guest artistic director at the Mesa Arts Center. We'll get into that a little later, but this is a big series coming to the city of Mesa, and we're so excited to have your expertise on this series for all of these concert goers. It's a dream come true. You know, you never know. I mean, some of the greatest things that have happened to me in my life are unexpected. Um, I met um, Randy Vogel back in 1998 at a, a series in Escondido, California. And we became very fast friends, uh, kept in touch over the years. And uh, when the Mesa Arts Center was built in the 2000s, um, he became the first uh, curator of that uh, building uh, for the region and, and began slowly inviting me to other things and different kinds of projects. And it led to this amazing collaboration that is well over a decade at this point uh, it evolved literally from how to serve the community better and how to bring music to everyone, not wow. just inside the Mesa Art Center. So a decade plus later, it continues to build and we're seeing now uh, the results of it with the young kids that we first got to uh, in elementary school that are now in college and coming back. It's amazing that 10 year window, how it's, you think of a childhood um, it's not 18 years of childhood. A childhood is not that long. No. And so we're, we've, we've done a few a few uh, uh, rounds around the track with that. So I would imagine that we, with beyond the tens of thousands of people that we've uh, been able to bring music to, uh, we've made two cycles think that this is normal. Wow. Wow. Well, and I, I like will that. get... Yeah. Well, that's incredible. Like working with the children in the community, bringing it back to them, growing them in their efforts. This is something they're going to remember forever. However, we'll get into that a little later. I want to get to know you a little bit more and I want our audience to get to know you a little bit more. You have a very decorated background. Can you start from the beginning? Well, let's just put put it this way. Everything that I'm living right now in my life is what was given to me as a young person. I come from a musical family. My mother's a pianist. My father's got his doctorate in music education. My sister's a violinist. I grew up near Washington, D.C., where the arts were celebrated and a, a vital part of everyone's life. I was introduced to many, many things as a young person, including piano and cello, soccer, art, um, lots of different kinds of sports, tennis. Um, but my parents had this motto that practice makes permanent. Per oh, okay. And they, to find one's passion, you have to learn correctly so you don't have to unlearn things. So when I got my first tennis racket in my hand, I had a private teacher for several lessons to make sure that I built from a stable foundation. Um, same with piano. My mother was my piano teacher. Uh, same with art. Same with math and education in that regard. Um, and when I found the cello at age four, that was it. There was the one thing in my life that people had to ask me to stop doing. I literally it could be worse. <laughs> I, did, I didn't want to sleep. I didn't want to eat. I didn't want to do my homework. I didn't want to do anything but feel what that cello made me feel. I didn't know, of course, at the time that music education and music teaches so much more than just playing the notes. It teaches you how to uh, navigate humanity. It teaches you how to feel and express yourself with confidence, how to take criticism, how to problem solve, all of these things. So my, my single digits through nine-ish, I just loved playing the cello all the time. And then a man came to me when my, about 11, 12 years old and said, that if I could find what I love to do and make that what I do, that I'd never work a day in my life. And um, I found that really interesting because it, it made me realize the separation of work and hobby. And most people work to make money to then spend the money on the things they really love to do. 
But what if you could reverse that and do what you love to do? And it, does it negate money? What does it do? Because it, it makes money different. Um, so I decided at 11 that that's what I wanted. I wanted to feel that thing that music gave me that affected every aspect of my life. And it at the time, I thought it was through cello performance. So I put in those 10,000 hours in my teens <clears throat> and went to uh, Conservatory of Music in Baltimore, Peabody Conservatory. And then I went to Juilliard uh, all the time seeking out opportunity to perform and to get into communities and do what was brought to me. And it kind of turned into a parallel career. Yes, of course, I'm a performing cellist, but I'm also involved in communities uh, because I do believe that grass is greener where you water it. And you can't okay. just be a transient all the time. And I say that with great respect to those who come into communities and play a great concert or whatnot and leave. But um, those who tend the fields daily are the ones who see the growth. Mm -hmm. um, so I've tried over the course of 30 years to get involved in communities where I can return frequently and continue with consistency the mission I have of just making music accessible. Yeah. Now tell me about why the cello? You could have picked so many other interests. What was it with the cello, especially at such a young age? It's it's pretty simple. First of all, I, again, everything, you know, when you look back in your childhood, are you basing it on pictures that you saw, stories that you heard, feelings that you felt? My parents didn't want me to play the violin because my sister's a violinist. Okay. When you're a young person, at least in that area of the world, the, the, the teaching technique was called Suzuki, which is uh, the Suzuki method of teaching is through imitation, not through reading music as a young, young, young person. The options of a, as a young person to play music are generally piano or strings because the lungs aren't developed uh, to be a, a wind player. So I started piano and they introduced me to the cello for the very reason that they didn't want me to be competitive with my sister throughout our whole childhood on violin. Okay. I, I never was, well, I'll, I'll reverse that. The cello was the only instrument that made me feel what it felt like to play because I wrapped my arms around it. Mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. I held the instrument. And so it was yeah. a very secure, confidence-building instrument. So that's why the cello. I didn't even realize at the time, 1976, 77, when I started the cello, that Rostropovich, the greatest cellist who's ever walked the earth, was moving to town to lead the National Symphony in Washington, D.C. Uh, as the conductor. So I was in cello heaven. Uh, Naturally. <laughs> everything was cello-driven, cello-centric. Uh, everybody loved Rostropovich. And I got the greatest instruction and the greatest inspiration uh, from age four through 20 when he finally left town. Yeah. Wow. Now tell me about your time at Juilliard. That is such a prestigious music school. You know, it's far and few in between for a lot of people. Obviously, it's clear why you went there, but what made you pick going there? And what was some maybe uh, teachers that you had or instructors that you had that helped you pursue more into your career? Great question. And I'll give you a very honest answer. Um, the reason why I went to Juilliard was, was for two reasons. Um, it wasn't Juilliard. It was the teacher. His name was Joel Krosnick, and he was the cellist of the Juilliard String Quartet. It was also the city of Manhattan. I had done everything one could possibly do artistically and professionally in Baltimore as an undergrad. My teacher at the time, Stephen Cates, said, you've got to go to a much bigger canvas to see how you can make an impact. And the only place that he mentioned was New York City. He said, you also need a musical guide that will help you transition while being in the jungle from a student to professional life, healthfully, mental health. What I'm saying is, is that New York has the biggest extremes, um, the most opportunity, the most people shooting for those opportunity. So when I went to Juilliard, I, I used Juilliard for everything that I could. I performed as much as I could there. I met as many musicians as I could there. I used New York City to hear other artists that were in the professional world performing uh, because everyone comes through New York. I, in hindsight, feel extremely lucky to have gone to that school. 
Um, but I didn't see it like that at the time. I didn't know the odds of getting it or not getting in. I just went in there, guns a blazing, for my four minute audition, which wow. is all it was. Yeah. I walked in, sat down, and four minutes later, I was outside the room, done. And I didn't realize the pressure. Uh huh. Youth, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I know exactly the pressure now. I I look at young people that are doing very high pressure things, and I'm freaking out watching them do that. But at the time, I didn't. Yeah, you don't even have a second thought. No. So Juilliard was very transformative for me. It, it, it did exactly what it was intended to do. It sharpened my tools. It created many, many more tools. It actually made me realize a, a bigger picture and a, my, a bigger plan um, for myself other than just playing the cello. I started seeing a lot of opportunity in other regard. And interestingly, some of my longest friends on earth are I met in New York uh, because it, it, it is a tightly knit musical community, even though it has so many people in the city. Yeah. So post Juilliard life, what did that look like for you? Is that when you started to dive into community? Is that when you realized, you know, really tending to your farm essentially is what was going to help grow you and the people around you? People say, I want to be a soloist or I want to, you know, be a traveling in a chamber group or whatnot. And my, my first response is, um, you won't know until you try. So try, and I don't mean actually the idea of being a professional musician, try. I mean, whether or not you can do it psychologically. From 19 or 18 on, I started traveling uh, mm -hmm. due to competition wins and, and other opportunities. And you start to realize after a while that you're spending most of your time by yourself and in airports and sitting there waiting for something to happen. To adapt to that lifestyle, um, I didn't like just sitting in hotel rooms. Um, that felt like it could be depressing, just sitting there practicing, <laughs> waiting. So I started getting out of the hotel rooms and going to find restaurants to see what the local food was. And then I started asking presenters that invited me what other things were happening in town for those three days that I was there. And you know, could I play at a school or could I go out and meet people for a donor benefit or whatever? I just wanted to be with people. And from 18 on, that started to kind of build a muscle tone, muscle set of needing to do more than just the event I was hired to do. Mm -hmm. And over the course of those next seven years, eight years from 18, 19 to I would say mid 20s, I built a career at that time, uh, relative to my age, uh, that could pay my bills and that felt healthy to me. Um, and as that progressed, living in New York, I worked and did less and less in New York City. So by my late 20s, I was on the road most of the time, spending time in communities. I visited El Paso, Texas when I was 29 years old. And through a couple of chance meetings, um, they asked if I might consider being their artistic director of their classical series. It was kind of fate because I was ready for it. I had built myself to want to give a lot to a community and September 11th happened. So for the first time ever, I didn't want to be in New York City. Wow, okay. And I didn't want to go back and I didn't wow. know what the world was doing. And I thought, you know, I really want to know people better and not just be this person who comes through town mm -hmm. and plays and leaves. I wanted a deeper connection. So I accepted wow. the position and that was in 2001. Yeah. Well, that all makes sense then. They literally said to me this very strange phrase. They wanted me to sculpt the cultural landscape of the region. And do you feel like you've done that? I live for it. And because okay. of that, that I didn't even know that I would be good at it or love it equally to playing mm -hmm. the cello. That's why all this other stuff happened. The blueprint of what we do uh, in El Paso and also Mesa and everywhere else. I tried to create residencies for musicians mm -hmm. to get to know the community. So when the artist comes on stage, the community knows them. Mm -hmm. They know them as mm -hmm. people, which means they trust their story and they trust them to thrill them. Yeah. Well, speaking of communities, we'll bring it back to Mesa, but I wanted to expand on a little bit of a bigger community that you're honestly now a part of. You were featured in an HBO series people might know, might not know, Oz, which 
again, you know, bigger community worldwide, really. Tell me about how you got involved in a project like that. It was never to become an actor. <laughs> the power of television and movies is beyond comprehension. And I'd worked so hard to be a cellist. I don't want to be an actor. I want to be a cellist. I want to mm -hmm. be a musician. So the quick story is back in 1994, I was asked to, to coach the actor Ned Beatty how to fake play the cello for an NBC TV show called Homicide, which was being filmed in Baltimore. Wow. I accepted. I thought that was interesting um, <laughs> because why not? I wasn't on the show, but why not? Subsequently, they asked me if I would play the soundtrack to the show so he'd be faking my performing. Fine. <laughs> Subsequently, I got to meet people that asked if I would, would like to be an extra in some more episodes, just hang out because we enjoyed being together. So for a, an episode, which was filmed in a long, long couple of days, I got to sit beside Robin Williams in an, in an episode called Bop Gun. And I was just an extra, but I got to sit. They placed me right beside him in the courtroom scene. And I got to spend the day talking to a person like that who's unmatched. He went to wow. Juilliard. He was filming... Um, Birdcage and getting ready to film um, Mrs. Doubtfire at the time. I loved that day with him, those few days, um, and subsequently got to know a lot of people on the set and hung out with them and had dinners with them. And then I moved to New York, and those same producers created the show Oz. That, yeah, full circle then, honestly, at that point. Right. And I said a million times over, I, um, they they came to me and they said we're we have this prison show that'll have a, a a cast of four or five, but then there's going to be a revolving door around them of real life people that do what they do, but will be written on or off the show as we see fit. Uh -huh. They hired Rick Fox from the Los Angeles Lakers basketball player to come on as a a, a basketball player gone wrong. Um, they hired me to play a murderous cellist. So <laughs> I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but I I did ask that they rewrite my character to not say or do certain things because I said my my audience won't understand that that's not me. So my dialogue was just primarily talking about um, being alone, uh, mm -hmm. playing my cello, um, missing playing with others. Um, and feeling disconnected from community. Yeah, um, then yeah. I, then, I, then I was killed in a riot really quickly. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that. I just had to get your thoughts on it because it was such a fun part of my research just seeing that. But then also hearing that you are the one that pushes to incorporate the cello into everything that you do. Like you said, you didn't want to be an actor. You're a cellist. You're a musician. How can you showcase that in any setting? And that's truly unique that you were able to get an opportunity to do the so. That I, the other thing that I added to that was that I said that I have to be able to play a lot on the show and I want okay. to play real music. And so the good news about um, copyright is that mm -hmm. a lot of the music that we play as classical musicians, those composers have been dead for over a century, which means the show didn't have to pay for anybody uh, the residuals <laughs> or rights or exactly so they gave me a lot of platform to play david popper and paganini and bach and chopin and maria von paradis uh and people like that 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 then when i went out to play in concert people said i really liked your music on that tv show oz it was basically the best outreach community engagement i could ever do with the biggest audience possible Wow. Incredible. Now, again, with Community, you had another opportunity and you did a series on NPR now. So we're going from movies, TV to radio. Can you tell me about what you did with NPR? Are you talking about the Tiny Desk concert? Yes. So that was interesting because I think I was one of the first. I mean, it was a long time ago. I, that yeah. might have been 14 years ago at this point. I thought it was a radio broadcast. So I just mm -hmm. wore like a, a regular shirt and regular yes. outfit. Like, <laughs> I came walking into an office in Washington, D.C., and they had cameras set up everywhere. And I went, what are we What are we doing here? And they said, we're going to film you being you, talking about your cello. Just play for us and talk. And let's let's we're, we're creating this new series, blah, blah, blah. And that's what that was. There was no 
um, precedent set. Mm -hmm. I just played and talked and people were there laughing with me. I didn't realize that it was going to turn into this juggernaut uh, that everyone watches. You know, where, wherever I play, and I say that when I, because I tour Alaska a lot, mm -hmm. and I play in these villages that are literally a, a two-hour plane ride from any major city like Anchorage or Fairbanks. I fly yep. to Nome and Barrow and McCoriak. They watch this to prepare for my visit. And when I walk into these little villages that have maybe 200 people, I am treated like a super celebrity, like, oh my God, this is the guy from Tiny Desk Concerts. Yeah. Um, the, the, the reach of this show is tremendous. I am so grateful to have done it when I did it, to have it accessible. It's such a fun opportunity. Now, I want to bring it to Mesa. Like I mentioned in the beginning, you are now the guest artistic director at the Mesa Art Center. This isn't your first time or first experience here in Mesa at all. How did this all come about? Again, it was trust um, and a project that, that, that kind of broke the barrier. I'll make this quick. In 2007, okay. I played a, a general cello recital, 2008 at the Mesa Art Center maybe nine, but Randy Vogel invited me to come back to do a special project of the complete Bach cello suites, which is about a two and a half hour show. And he just said, you know, make it as personal as you can, because this is a lot for audiences, just solo cello. So I got on stage and I just played, but I also just talked to them about what to listen for, why this was important to me, and then I would play. And then kind of the history of the evolution of music through that time period, and then I would play. Then the cello, then I would play. And after that show, the Mesa Arts Center received a lot of letters from the audience saying, wow. this is the way the concert should be presented. Because it wasn't like going to the aquarium where you just hear someone play, watch someone play and leave. It was interactive-ish. Mm -hmm. And so Randy said, do you know other musicians that could do what you did? And I said, I know a few that would be comfortable. He said, well, I don't want to gamble. Would you come back with them and, and basically guide them through it? Wow. I said, if, if the timing is correct, I'd be honored to come back and help you build this new idea. So the next season, I think there were three, four concerts, and I, I helped them through that. And I went on the community and I helped them put together some connections with other organizations. Then it went well, and they started building a bigger audience. But more so, they could say that they, they were interactive with 5,000 young people or other people in communities, including hospitals, including senior centers and um, country clubs, things like that. And then I was invited back again, and then it turned into a guest artistic director. and then it. They invited me back again. And literally a decade passed and we started planning further and further. Right now we're in a five-year plan. Wow. So I'll be there with them for at least 15 years total. And oh in five gosh. years, we will see if this, where, where we are with it. But we mm -hmm. are unveiling an even bigger platform this year. And we're programming two years in the future now. It's extremely exciting. But for the first seven years, it was year by year. Yeah, yeah. You had to you had to test it out, right? Like we couldn't make a full commitment, but they they are and they're committed to you and your craft and your trust that you keep saying. You know, this isn't something that's given overnight, right? Trust trust is the key word because it's very personal. Mm -hmm. I you know, I give I come out on stage and I welcome everyone. I go sit with them in the audience. I sometimes collaborate with the performers that come in. I am in the community um, all day long for those four days that I'm there. I'm meeting with donors. I am talking to other organizations about how to make the arts more significant in the region. Mm -hmm. um, and it really was built with love and trust. And here we are. Yeah. Now, with all of that, can you give our audience a little bit of a sneak peek of the performers that are coming to this next series that's happening at the Mesa Arts Center? Yeah, we, we do listen to what people want and listen, and, and it's not going to all be the same. So with, with today's programming, a typical recital is something we don't do as much anymore. So we have, we start off our season with a, a wonderful vocal group of about 10 people um, that are going to, it's called Room Full of Teeth. And what? that's a unique name. <laughs> the only instruments on stage are their bodies and their voices 
and uh, their spirit. So it's going to be an incredible vocal display of what we have as human beings as the perfect instrument, our voice. Then we have uh, in November, Najoma Grievous. And um, she's an incredible violinist who won the Sphinx competition that I happened to be adjudicating a year ago, the grand prize. And she's coming to give a standard, beautiful, classic violin recital. So it'll be violin and piano. And she'll be in the, in the community performing as well. That the art form of a, of a standard recital is something so beautiful to behold. And she is a glorious personality and player. And I, this is, I couldn't imagine a better person doing that. So she's coming nice. then. Then we've got the Galvin Cello Quartet coming in late January. Um, and they won the Concert Artists Guild International Competition. And they're going to rock it out. They're going to play everything from Piazzolla to Bach to, um, well, the tangos, of course, to soundtracks to <clears throat> other classics. You know, I say this all the time, but the cello is most like the human voice. It has the capacity and the range. But you put four of them together, it's like a quartet on steroids yeah. because they can do anything. I, I mean, if you've imagine. ever heard... If you've ever heard the theme from Game of Thrones, uh -huh. it's like it's like that, but like an elephant stampede. Um, wow. It's going to be amazing. So they're coming to do that. Uh, then we have um, the Amani Winds, which is a, a, a quintet of wind players that just won the Grammy Award this past year. Their ensemble is over a century, over a quarter century old and celebrated. Uh, they're established and revered. But again, if you go through it, we've got the voice, we've got the violin, we've got a cello quartet, we've got winds. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to end our season with Mike Block Trio. Mike Block is a cellist, but he is so much more than a cellist. He's also a singer. In my opinion, he sounds a lot like James Taylor. Um, and he puts the cello on his body, straps it on, and walks around singing, playing with a mandolin and a bass. And they do original compositions as well as transcriptions and covers. He's also in the Silk Road Ensemble. Uh, he's the other cellist to Yo-Yo Ma in that ensemble. Wow. And uh, he is, I wanted to bring him because he'll show young musicians and older musicians, how these instruments can be used in so many different kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a terrific season. It's from top to bottom, it sounds like everybody's handpicked to a way that fits a need for the audience for what you're an expert in doing. Now, just to wrap it up, you know, you're spending time here in Mesa. What are you doing as far as community for Mesa? I know that you said you've worked with the youth, but is there anything else that you are involved with with your time while working with the Mesa Arts Center, getting back to the community in Mesa? Sure. Well, what I didn't mention is we are establishing a much more firm connection with ASU. Wow. Um, absolutely. We're doing that. Almost all the artists are giving classes there. We're bringing musicians over to help collaborate with the artists. We're establishing a hospital performance series. Wow. And so we're going to, because, you know, you think about it, um, no one wants to be in a hospital. No. And <laughs> including, obviously, the patients, the, even the doctors are under stress and the nurses. Mm -hmm. So to establish a performing arts series there that can be streamed into the rooms the, for those who can't get out, uh, for those who can who are sitting in the lobby, that's a thing that we're we're working on. We're also establishing a senior center series that's going to be consistent um, for those who were the consistent patrons 20 years ago, who now live in communities that that cater to them. We're going to take care of them as well. That's beautiful. I truly believe that music is medicine. So mm -hmm. we go into psychiatric institutions uh, to help young people as well as older people with the fact that music does affect the brain in positive ways and help with anxieties and tensions. Yeah. So that is included on top of our school series. We have a series that we've been used uh, over the years called Bach in School or Bach to School. We're also trying to tour a bit outside of the realm. Mesa's huge. Mesa's he, very huge. <laughs> Ginormous, huge. And so we're trying to give ourselves some space and time to travel much further out to represent the Mesa Arts uh, Center as being wow. the heartbeat that pumps out all good things to the entire region. So if you look at our series, you can call, you can look online, you can go to social media, 
uh, Mesa Arts Center is on Instagram, my own Zool Bailey on Instagram. You'll see what we're doing. We do pop-ups a lot too, because we try to find places that classical music is not typical and we flood that area with it. And it's amazing what happens. The thing that I find most interesting about that is that the young people stop their parents in their tracks because the young people want to listen. Mm -hmm. The parents are so wrapped up in their day that they, they're they like, no, 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 we have to go. But the young people say, no, 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 we have to listen. Yeah. Get into that younger generation and then influence up, right? <laughs> and then to see the smile on the parents' face like, oh, yes, I yeah. should do this more. Teaching people to slow down just a little bit, right? Just to take a deep breath occasionally. Yeah. I'll end on this question, Zul. What is the next 10 years look like for you, 20 years? What does what your future hold? Great question. Um, I think that I'm, I'm 52 now. So that's a really interesting question because I do want the next chapter to be evolving. Definitely more community engagement, definitely more time in communities. Um, I'm establishing personally uh, other connections with orchestras to be an artist in residence, to try to be a part of that. This is much more important to me than, than again, the one-offs. Um, the cello is definitely the, the, the lantern that shows me my path and the future, but it's hard for me to answer that question because it's already in motion. Yeah, uh, because I feel so healthy right now. Um, so what's happening? What I changed since COVID has directly affected um, my my life in a good way, and I'm seeing that through that, it's affecting others around me through these communities. Um, you know what I missed most about during COVID? I just missed being with people. The concerts now to me are a reason to gather, to be together, to be inspired. So as a curator, I'm trying to do more of that. It's personally driven because I need it myself. Yeah. No, I love that. Well, Zul, we'll end it right there. Mesa is so excited to have you at the Mesa Arts Center. We're so excited about this series that you're bringing, what you're doing for our communities. It's huge. I know this will inspire so many people from old to young, right? Um, and we can't wait to have you in our city here in the next couple of months. Well, classical music inside out. Mesa Arts Center, see you there. Awesome. Thanks, Zul. Thank you. All right, guys, that's a wrap with City Limitless. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll see you next week. Bye. Hey,